people. Today we're going to be studying from the book of Matthew, chapter 22. The title of the lesson, The Wedding Banquet. Beginning in verse 1. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fatted cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off. Wonders field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited do not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out in the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told the attendants, tie him hand and foot, throw him outside into the darkness, where there will be weeping and a gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen, and the church said. Amen. You know, for many, at first glance, this looks an awful lot like the parable of the great banquet in Luke chapter 14. But in fact, they're very, very different parables. If you recall, the one in Luke chapter 14 centered in on the making excuses, but simply started out that there was a certain man who held a banquet. Right here, we find in this parable that Jesus is revealing himself in a much clearer light as the central person of the kingdom, the son of the king, the son of God. Amen? We also need to remember that Matthew is the gospel written to the Jews. And so, for the Jews, they understood the basis of this parable very well. Because all through the scriptures, many prophets had used the allegory of God being the bride and Israel, God's people, excuse me, being the bride and God being the groom. That marriage was between God and his people. This was the covenant that was made. And so with the wedding comes the invitation. And the Bible says that he sent out servants to tell those that have been invited, hey, the dinner is now ready. Now we understand those servants to be the prophets, amen? amen? And the Bible says right here in verse 5, but they paid no attention. They paid no attention. So our point one is preoccupation. The people when they were invited were preoccupied. The Bible says, in fact, that they paid no attention. One went off to his field and another to his business. He's saying, the Jews in the countryside, in the fields, they paid no attention. The Jews in the city with their business, they paid no attention. And then he goes on and he says, The rest, his servants mistreated them and he killed them. Wow. So right now we have a group of people who make light of, they pay no attention of the prophets, and another group who mistreat and kill the prophets. So we see these two classes of, quote, unbelievers. You know, I don't know about you, but I thought there was a very powerful sharing, particularly on Salud's part. And there was a scripture that I shared with her yesterday, and we talked about 1 Corinthians 15, but there's another one in 1 Timothy chapter 1. And right here, Paul is sharing late in his life. And he says in verse 12, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has given me strength, that he considered me faithful, appointing me to his servant. Even though I was once a blasphemer and a persecutor and a violent man, 
I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out of me abundantly, along with the faith and the love that are in Christ Jesus. Here's a trustworthy saying that deserves full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I'm the worst. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy, so that in me, the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience as an example for those who would believe on him and receive eternal life. Right here, Paul gets totally open about his life before he's a Christian. He says, I was a blasphemer and a persecutor. I was a violent man. And then God came into my life. Here's a trustworthy saying. Jesus Christ came into the world to save sinners. And he says, of whom I am the worst. Now that needs to be all of our spirits. Amen, guys? And I love what he says right here in verse 16. But for that very reason, I was shown mercy so that in me with the worst of sinners, Christ Jesus might display his unlimited patience. He says, hey, if I can become a Christian, then anybody can become a Christian. And I could tell Salud was very fired up about that. Paul encouraged her to this day that people can make that radical of a transformation. And so the message goes out to all people. Hey, anybody can change when they respond. To the invitation of God to come to the wedding feast, the church of God. Amen, church? Let's go back to the book of Matthew. When we find, the Bible says, the rest seized his servants, mistreated him, killed him. Then we read in verse 7, the king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned Their city. Then he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited do not deserve to come. Wow. He says, If you do not accept the invitation to come to the wedding banquet, you are unworthy. But he goes actually a little bit further than that. And so our second point right here is provocation. Provocation. You know, uh, the Bible says very clearly the king was enraged because they didn't come. Well, I want us to get kind of an idea of why God would be so upset. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. In verse 3. Praise be to the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ, in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. Right here, the Bible says, hey, in Christ, we have been given every spiritual blessing. And he goes, he has lavished upon us his grace, which gives us the forgiveness of sins. Now, the interesting thing is that a lot of people don't understand in verse 4, it says, for he chose us in him before the creation of the world. Wow. Before God created anything. He knew he was going to create man. He knew man would fall. And he knew we'd have to send Jesus to die for us so he would have a people of his very own. Wow. Isn't that amazing how long God has been preparing to have a covenant relationship with his people? You know, uh, it's not going to be very long before Thanksgiving is upon us. And I know about you. Thanksgiving is my absolute favorite holiday. Well, because you don't have to get any gifts, and there's lots of food, amen? (laughs) And for that, there's a lot of thanksgiving. (laughs) And uh, growing up, I was very fortunate. My mom was one of the best cooks of all time. And and she still is. She still is, in case she listens to this tape. (laughs) But you know, my mom, she starts cooking for thanksgiving about three days beforehand. I mean, she goes and she buys everything, brings it on home, and then she starts making all these different concoctions. 
I mean, she has all these delectable side dishes and the meats. And, of course, our family's favorite, all these different kinds of pies. You know, the lemon meringue pie, the blueberry, the pecan. You know, am, I, am I talking your language right here? Now, what? Can you just imagine it? If us three kids, me, Randy, and Dana, on Thanksgiving Day, go, Mom, we're not coming to Thanksgiving dinner. We're going someplace else, and we're going to watch a football game and eat some McDonald's stuff. Oh, oh I wouldn't even want to be around. Could you imagine any mom, what their response is going to be? They would be enraged because why? They've been preparing this banquet with so much love for so long. And her kids are rejecting it. How much more? Our God has been preparing a great banquet of the kingdom since before creation. And the Bible says that men blew it off. Paid no attention. And others got downright hostile. They persecuted the messages. You know, back in the passage, there's a part that could be overlooked. It said, the king was enraged and he sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their cities. The Jews would have fully understood. For God had used human armies before to discipline his people. When Israel drifted so far away from God, there was no remedy for their sin. God sent in the Assyrian army to conquer them and send them into exile. Later, Judah drifted likewise so far away from God, there was no remedy. God sent in the Babylonian army and totally decimated the city and the temple itself and sent all in Judah and Jerusalem in exile. And the prophecy would be here true too as well. Those that did not accept the message of Jesus in that generation, God sent in the Roman army into Jerusalem in 70 AD, headed by Titus, the future emperor. And he totally annihilated the city. There were 1.1 million inhabitants. A million men, women, children, and babies were slaughtered by the Romans. And the other 100,000 were taken into slavery. God's discipline is strong for those that reject him. And he finds them unworthy. What's kind of interesting, we read on. In verse 9, he said, the wedding banquet's ready, but those that I invited but turned me down don't deserve to come. So in verse 9, he says, go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you can find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. He says, okay, these people have rejected me. Now. Go out into the streets and the byways and just get anyone that you can to come and be at the wedding banquet. Good or bad, I don't care what their life's like. Just ask them to come to the wedding banquet. And the Bible says that they gathered and the wedding banquet was full. This, of course, is the allusion to the response of the Gentiles to the call of God. Amen, guys? You know, it's pretty encouraging, I think, that the message goes out to everyone. Just come as you are. You hear the message? Whether you're good or whether you're bad, just come on to the wedding banquet. Pretty cool, huh? You know, one of the things that is so powerful about the Word of God are the barriers that it struck down in the first century. And the barriers 
that it struck down between people in the 21st century. Let's look at them in the book of Acts. Let's go to Acts chapter 8. In Acts 8, it says in verse 12, But when they believed Philip, as he preached the good news of the kingdom of God, and in the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Number one, this is powerful in the first century and equally powerful in the 21st. The gospel struck down the sexual barrier. Men and women are equal in the kingdom of God. In Acts chapter 8, verse 27. So Philip started out, and on his way he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians. The Ethiopians, of course, are black. The racial barrier was struck down by the gospel. It didn't matter what race you were. If you come to the wedding banquet, you will be received. We also know in Acts chapter 3, this in verse 2. Now a man crippled from birth was being carried to the temple gate called Beautiful, where he is put every day to beg from those going in the temple courts. The Bible says that this crippled beggar was healed and brought into the kingdom. He was so fired up, he was jumping up and down all the way into the temple courts. What a contrast to the man we just read about in chapter 8. The Ethiopian eunuch, well, he was also secretary of the treasury of all of Ethiopia. And if you're watching over the money, you got to be pretty rich yourself. So the beggars come into the kingdom, and the rich come into the kingdom, and the economic barrier is destroyed by the gospel. Amen, church? Amen. Go to Acts chapter 17. In Acts 17, Paul goes and he preaches in Athens, the academic center of the known world. In the verse 33, after he was done, it says, At that, Paul left the council. A few men became followers of Paul and believed. Among them was Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, also a woman named Demarius, and a number of others. Unbelievable! Dionysus, a member of the Areopagus, became a disciple of Jesus Christ. Once more, standing in contrast to the beggar who most likely had little or no education, here is this most learned of men, Dionysus, who became a disciple of Jesus. And so the education barrier is struck down by the gospel. We know in Acts 2, the Jews received the gospel in Jerusalem. In Acts 28, we read about the Gentiles in great numbers receiving the gospel in Rome. Both Jews and Gentiles alike came into the kingdom. And so the political barrier was brought down. Yes, Republicans can be saved. Yes, Democrats can be saved. I know that's hard for some to believe. But in Christ, the barrier is brought down. Turn to Acts 16. In Acts 16, we read these words of great joy. In verse 33, At that hour of the night the jailer took them and washed their wounds. Then immediately he and all his family were baptized. The jailer brought them into his house and set a meal before them. He was filled with joy because he'd come to believe in God, he and his whole family. So here the head jailer becomes a disciple, and his kids were old enough to become disciples. His whole family becomes Disciples, and it's pretty awesome that we're going to see Enrique and Jorge's moms get baptized today, amen. And so now we understand that the age barrier has been brought down by the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, there is no barrier in the kingdom of God. Does that fire you on up? I mean, if you look around right here, you see it all. You see men and you see women. And a lot of churches, you don't see many men because they think religion is for the women. You see black, white, Latin, Asian, and every shade in between. You see the rich and the poor. Maybe more poor than rich. You see the educated and the uneducated. 
But we love everybody at UCLA too. Amen, guys? We see the political spectrum right here, and we even see a lot of people that don't give a darn about politics. And we see all ages. And isn't it great? The Holy Spirit's brought John. He's gathered John to be with us. Going to be 80 years old on Halloween Day. Does that fire you on up or not? See, there's a proclamation that's got to go on out. And we are the proclaimers. Are you with me right here? But there's something that we need to understand to motivate us to proclaim. Let's go back to Matthew 22. After they go out, and the hall is filled. A very interesting notations made by Jesus in verse 11. It says, but when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. What's well, an issue of presentation now? You know, earlier in the passage, we saw the national judgment against the Jews. All the prophets had come, and the people had rejected the invitation to the wedding. That was national judgment. But right here, we see that there is individual judgment. And judgment of people who even, quote, got into the wedding banquet. Well, we need to wrestle with this because in this judgment we see right here that when this man was confronted that he didn't have wedding clothes, he was absolutely speechless. In other words, before God, there are no excuses. There are no excuses before God. But what was Jesus saying right here? Because in a way, why would God, the king, be down on these people that were invited from the streets, good and bad, and they were just invited, he says, just, just, just come as you are. And then seemingly he's down on this guy because he doesn't have the right clothes on. Huh. There's an answer for us over in Zephaniah chapter 1. I know most of you knew that anyway, but I, I just thought we'd go on over and read it anyway. <laughs> Zephaniah chapter 1. This is the illusion that Jesus is making. Verse 7. This is very cool. Be silent before the sovereign Lord, for the day of the Lord is near. The Lord has prepared a sacrifice. He has consecrated those he has invited. On the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I will punish the princes and the king's son and all those clad in foreign clothes, or King James Version, strange apparel. Well, we understand even the allusion earlier in the parable itself that the fatted calf would be butchered. Jesus, of course, is foreshadowing his own death to prepare the wedding feast. And right here, the Bible says that the Lord has prepared the sacrifice and he's consecrated everybody he's invited. But on the day of the Lord's sacrifice, I'm going to punish all those people, all those who are clad in foreign clothes, strange apparel. Now, what he's talking about here is not whether or not your clothes are nice enough, but that you have the right clothes on that everybody else has. It would be like being dressed in blue and gold for UCLA and then finding a guy with a garnet and gold jersey in the middle of the locker room. You're going, that dude does not belong. For those who don't know, that's USC's colors, okay? Amen. I think that went a little fast for some of you guys out there. <laughs> See, we need to understand 
that one of the most long-standing customs of the East is to give new garments at any kind of a welcoming or a festival. Let's look at a couple allusions to this in the scriptures in Genesis 45. In Genesis 45, we find Joseph in sending off his brothers In verse 22 it reads, To each of his brothers, Joseph gave new clothing. But to Benjamin he gave 300 shekels of silver and five sets of clothes. Wow, this was special. It happened later on, 2 Kings chapter 5. This is during the ministry of Elisha. And at that time he had an assistant named Jehazi. He's a, kind of a dishonest guy, but I think we can pick up some good things right here. In 2 Kings chapter 5 and verse 22, Jehazi goes to Naaman, who had just had his skin cleansed by dipping himself seven times into the Jordan. And in verse 22 we read, Everything's all right, Jehazi answered. My master sent me to say, Two young men from the company of the prophets have just come to me from the hill country of Ephraim. Please give them a talent of silver and two sets of clothing. So right here, these guys... Actually, Jehazi's lying, but the principle is there, is that he says, hey, these two guys have just come to be prophets. They've joined us. We need some money, and we need some fresh clothes to welcome them. So that was the practice in the East at that particular time for centuries, as a matter of fact. Well, with that in mind, we're going to go to a scripture that was super well known to the Jews, Isaiah chapter 61. In verse 10, I delight greatly in the Lord. My soul rejoices in my God, for he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has arraigned me in a robe of righteousness, as a bridegroom adorns his head like a priest, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels. For as the soil makers the sprout comes up, as the garden causes seeds to grow, so the sovereign Lord will make righteousness and praise spring up before all nations. Wow! What's it take to come before the presence of God? He says, I am going to clothe you with garments of salvation and robes of righteousness. Set fire you on up right here. And then he says, these people are going to grow up and make righteousness and praise spring up before all the nations. This is the prophecy of the church and of Christianity going around the world in that generation. Amen, church? Well, you know, it is... Really awesome when you think about it, to be given something free. Has anybody here like free stuff? Yeah. Uh, a lot of hands went up there. <laughs> Got the back row fired up. That's awesome. <laughs> free stuff. You know, people will, will spend gobs of money just to get some free stuff. <laughs> you know, some sisters save so much money to sale, they're broke. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> You know, I had, I had one of those days I've just got to share with you about a month ago. And uh, I, I had a couple things that I, that I felt inclined that I needed to do. I hadn't been out to the New York church for over a year to be able to preach to the new church planting out there. And secondly, just to spend time with, with DJ, the preacher there, my son in the faith there, as well as to go see my son, Sean, who lives on the weekends in New York City. And so because the church in New York is kind of poor like us, uh, there was no money to send me on out. So Elaine and I took some of my uh, uh, frequent flyer miles and got a ticket to go on out. And uh, I, was, I was so looking forward to going. But the problem was I had to work late into the night because you know how it is when you got a trip. You try to get everything done before you leave. Well, my plane left at 610. And I figured my ride had to pick me up at 4.30. And I had to get up at 3.30 because I wanted to have a quiet time, everyone. And so I go in, I get all my stuff done, and Elena's away at her parents. I get all my stuff done, and it's 1.30 in the morning. And I'm looking at that bed going, 
two hours. Should I stay awake or should I hit the sack? And I, I, I didn't pray about it, but I decided to hit the sack. And I, I honestly don't remember whether I forgot to turn on the alarm or whether I turned it on and then hit it. You know what I'm talking about right there? Put out of its misery. The next thing I know, I hear this sound on my, my door. Chip, open the door! Open the door! I'd ask Michael Kirshner to pick me up and take me. It's now 5.30 in the morning. Michael goes, we're supposed to leave an hour ago. Amen. I said, okay, just a sec. Because I knew I couldn't make the plane, 6.10. So I called up United. And uh, had, I, I, I thought about this for a while. What excuse? And I said, you know some. maybe I just should tell the truth. <laughs> so I called him up. I said, hey, this is Mr. McKean. And uh, I was supposed to take a 6.10 flight to New York City. And I overslept. And the lady goes, oh, I've done that lots of times. I said, well, is there another flight that I can get? And she goes, well, there's one at 11. I said, that put me in way too late. I'm going to see my son out there. Uh, she says, well, there's one at 8.30. I said, can I go on that one? I tell you what, I'll, I'll put you in. Thanks. I go, how much is this going to cost? She says, you know something? It'll be free. I was feeling good about myself. Had, <laughs> had myself a nice shower. Got to the uh, airport and flew on out to New York City, and then I landed, and, and the brothers and sisters at the church there greeted me at the airport with, I love you with the love of the Lord. And usually I have to take a taxi on in, but the brothers provided a van, amen, free stuff. <laughs> and I always, I, I've been joking with DJ for a long time about the fact that he put the whole mission team, we went out there a couple of years ago to spy out the land in the worst God-forsaken hotel in all of New York City called the Hotel Carter. Shh. I mean, I remember walking into our room. There's, no, there's, there's nothing there. There are no chairs. just this dingy bed that's kind of like this. And the, the light is just a string, and then there's a light bulb. There's no shade on the light at all. And I, I was kind of teasing. I go, oh, DJ, you better not put me in the Hotel Carter. Because he had, he had gotten online and tried to find me a cheaper hotel downtown because I was paying for it. He says, oh, bro, I went by it the other day, and this is the most cranking comfort in. I go, amen. So we pull it up, and sure enough, I mean, it's this brass thing, bunches of lights. I go, wow, DJ, dude, you repented. <laughs> I go on in, introduce myself, and they go, this is the wrong comfort inn. I just saw DJ draw back, slowly like this. I, I look around, and then they said, the, the words you most fear, it's on the other side. And you kind of wonder, the other side of what? We drive over there, I'm not kidding. This is just barely a sign, and you walk down, like a dungeon to get into this place. I'm looking at DJ, he's going, I this, you know, and, and, and these guys are yelling at the desk. I go, oh my goodness. So I finally get to the front line, and I said, I'm Mr. McKean, and the guy goes, oh, I'm so sorry. About what? We don't have a room for you. I'm looking at DJ. He says, but uh, we've managed to get you in to the Hampton Inn, which is a major upgrade. And I said, well, how much is this going to cost? He says, it's free. What about the second night? It's free. What about the tax? It's free. What about the breakfast? It's free. I'm going, wow, this is awesome. This is incredible. I am so fired up. I've forgiven DJ everything. I was so fired up. Then that night, I'd ask DJ and Casey... And my son, Sean, if we all get together for dinner. And we all love Indian food. So I said, Sean, take me to your favorite. So we go to the Indus Valley restaurant, and we get there. We have this unbelievable thing. And I said, okay, guys, order a lot of stuff, because I'm the old guy, you know. Okay, guys, so you have this and that. And Sean had gotten up in the middle of the meal, and I hadn't really noticed anything. Well, the bill came, and I saw that his charge card was there. I go, wow, my son finally paid for a meal. <laughs> 
I go, this is incredible. It's been a free day. It's been awesome. God has given me grace. He let me sleep in a couple extra hours. I had singing at the airport, a free trip in. I have a gorgeous hotel room. And I had a free dinner paid by my son. What more could a man want in his lifetime? <laughs> and I was, I was like so grateful. I really was grateful. Because I knew that if I'd had spent money after I, we did the frequent flyer things, I'd get a rebuke from Elena that I had to spend money and I overslept. So thank you, God. <laughs> Are you fired up when you get free stuff? Well, your salvation that you're wearing right now, your garment of salvation, your robe of righteousness, it's free. Amen. It's been given to you. Say, so, well, when was it given? Turn over to Galatians chapter 3. Paul also alludes to that passage and that custom. In Galatians 3, we read in verse 26, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave or free, male nor female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you're Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Is this awesome? He says, when you believe in Jesus, when you repent of your sins, and then when you're baptized... As we're going to see today with Stefan and Tosin and, of course, Enrique and, um, I forget the other, uh, Jorge. Jorge's mom. When they go down in that water, they're going to come up. All their sins are going to be forgiven. Amen. They're going to have the Holy Spirit. And they're going to be wearing salvation clothes. Their robe. Of righteousness. Is that awesome? Well, I got to ask you, how grateful are you to that gift? You see, the king came to those that were not wearing clothes of righteousness, those that were not living the life of a disciple. And there was a challenge that was given to him. Let's get back to the passage. In Matthew 22, the man was speechless and then it says, Then the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into darkness, where there be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are invited, but few are chosen. The Bible says right here, Because this man was not wearing salvation clothes, because he was not robed in righteousness, you're to tie them up hand and foot and throw them into outer darkness. Of course, what he's saying right here, if you bind a person hand and foot, says it's totally out of his power to resist. This is what is going to happen. You know, I, I still remember back in fifth grade. I had this shirt that I loved. It was a plaid shirt. And the big rage in that day was for people to take what was called a Fruit Loop. And the Fruit Loops were kind of these remnant things that they, they put the, the little loop on the back of your shirt. I, just, I think it's supposed to hang, to be how you hung things on up, but I, I never did that. So. But the, the little Fruit Loop back there, and of course the big rage in fifth grade was to take the Fruit Loop. Well, this one girl tried to grab my Fruit Loop and totally ripped my shirt. And here I am, just going, you know, like half nude around, around the thing. And the teacher said, you've got to go home. You've got to go home. See, even school teachers have a standard of clothing. How much more so God when we are not robed in righteousness? If we are not living the life of a disciple... If we are not denying ourselves every day, sharing our faith, encouraging one another, 
being in all the meetings of the body. We are not righteous. And we need to have a conviction about that. If we are not focusing on the true doctrine, if we are weak in our convictions about who is saved and who is lost, that is going to take us out of the kingdom of God. And we need to understand that right here, God is very serious about our righteousness. And if we are as people, we should be too. In the passage, the bride does not appear because, of course, we understand the bride to be the church. And Jesus hasn't died and resurrected and gone to heaven for the spirit to start the church. But let's end looking at the bride. Go to Revelation chapter 21. In verse 1, we got we to end on a high note. I mean, guys, we, we, can't, we can't just talk about this guy being bound up and thrown into outer darkness. <laughs> verse 1, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and they're true. Wow, now we know why we take notes, huh? <laughs> right here we have the vision of the bride, the new Jerusalem, the church, the people of God. And you know, uh, it's kind of interesting last night, uh, Ellie and I had an opportunity, we were invited to a birthday party. This unbelievable place up in Mandeville Canyon in a gated community. Now, Mandeville Canyon's got cranking houses on it. But this is a gated community in Mandeville Canyon. <laughs> I mean, it was something else. And it was the old headmaster at the school that our children had attended was celebrating his 60th birthday, and we were fortunate enough to be invited. So we had to dress up. So we dressed up. But on the way home, and then he goes, you know, you've, we've got to pick up some couple of things at 7-Eleven. I said, okay, amen. So I go into 7-Eleven, pick up the stuff, and this young man's the cash guy there, you know, and he goes, huh, dressed up for a hot date, huh? <laughs> I said, yeah, it's with my wife. He goes, oh. I said, said, that's how most people look at marriage. You can't have a hot date as a wife. I'm here to tell you, if you're not married to a hot date, you need to come to the marriage retreat. I'm here to tell you, if you're married to a hot date, you'll want to come to the marriage retreat. See, everybody's invited to the marriage retreat if you're married. Because it'll change your life. Amen, guys? In all seriousness, when he said it, it was sad. But I, I, I just got back in the car and I thought, you know something? I do have a hot date. I am so blessed with the most incredible bride. I still remember our rehearsal dinner. My dad paid for it. Free stuff. <laughs> we had filet mignon. It was special. Because, see, up at that point, because I decided to go into the ministry, my dad hadn't talked to me for three years. And that night when he saw and heard all the love and the sharing, he got up in tears and apologized to me. 
And then Elena's dad got up and apologized for their persecution. So you can imagine the next day was unbelievable. I still remember that song, Morning Has Broken. We've only just begun. And I remember Elena coming down that aisle in white. It was a moment. It was a moment. I remember the celebration at the country club. Elena's parents paid for that. <laughs> I remember traveling on down to the place our first night there in Orlando and having Chateaubriand. First and last time, but it was good. <laughs> and then I remember going to the Bahamas for our honeymoon. Yeah, my dad paid for that too. <laughs> and I still remember, I mean, we, we were committed disciples because we, we had to go to church Wednesday night on our honeymoon wow. in Bahamas. <laughs> I remember going 7.30, nobody was at the church. We're thinking about leaving. About 10 till 8, six people show up. I said, what are you guys going to do? I don't know. I said, well, I'm a preacher. Well, why don't you lead a Bible study? I said, okay, I'll do that. <laughs> the next night, I won the dance contest. <laughs> but not before losing to Elena in tennis. So I, I feel like I broke even, but... You know, it's exciting as the rehearsal and the wedding and the honeymoon was. As disciples, it just gets better and better. Yeah. You know, I know a lot of us have been through some tough times as disciples. And sometimes we don't think the bride of Christ is so beautiful. And we lose sight that the awesomeness of heaven is before us. When ultimately, the church and God will come together. And it will be said in heaven that God is with his people. And because God is with his people, there will be no more mourning, no more crying, no more death, and no more pain. For the old order of things has passed away. Write this down, for this testimony is trustworthy, and it is true. Today, I hope you got some free stuff on. The clothes of salvation, the robe of righteousness. If not, get it quickly. Amen.